Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. I went on a trip just the other week that involved flying into Buffalo, New York. And since we were so close by, Niagara Falls, we went to Niagara Falls. (laughs) I had never been there before. And it reminded me that way back last summer, I had been planning to do a podcast on people going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. And then I stumbled across an article about Annette Kellerman while I was doing the research for that. I got completely distracted. I forgot totally about it. Having been reminded by going to the actual waterfall, we are going to get back to that today with Annie Edson Taylor, who was the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel And we're going to start off with a little bit of a brief history of industrialization and commercialization at Niagara because this whole barrel trip was part of a much bigger story of tourism and daredevils at this natural wonder. So Niagara Falls is a collection of three waterfalls on the border between the United States and Canada, Ontario on the Canadian side and New York on the U.S. side. And they're on the Niagara River between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. The falls are the Horseshoe Falls, the American Falls, and the Bridal Veil Falls. Sometimes Horseshoe Falls is known as Canadian Falls. Most of the Horseshoe Falls are on the Canadian side of the border, while American Falls and Bridal Veil Falls are both in the United States. Horseshoe Falls is the biggest of the three. It's the one that's shaped like a horseshoe, like its name suggests. And it's what comes to mind for a lot of people when you say Niagara Falls. Yeah, it's impressive in person. So it, it's, it does have sort of the iconic aspect to it. The area around Niagara Falls has been home to a number of Iroquoian-speaking indigenous peoples. Leading up to the 17th century, a confederation known as the Neutral lived on what would become the Canadian side of the river. And this name comes from the French describing them as neutral in conflicts between other Iroquoian nations and confederation. Uh, so this is a guess at pronunciation because we couldn't find a clear one, but the uh, Wenroranon or Wenro lived on the other side, and the Neutral Confederation and the Wenro were allies until 1639. After that, a combination of wars, epidemics, and other factors led to both of them being dispersed by and absorbed into other Iroquoian tribes and nations. Yeah, there are descendants of these people surely living still today, but there's a whole complicated history of all the various Iroquoian peoples. They were not a monolith. So some people wound up going to completely different parts of the country. Others sort of made their way into other tribes and nations. Uh, The first European known to see the falls was probably Father Louis Hennepin, who was a French priest in 1678. And he wrote about it after he got back to France. Although, in his account, he said that the falls were 600 feet tall. They are really about 170 feet or 52 meters tall. The first European settlements in the area were started after the Revolutionary War. It's hard to eyeball distance and scale, I understand. (laughs) And they are quite impressive. They are. Uh, I could see where you you would think they were way bigger than they actually are. The nearby city of Buffalo, New York, started to grow dramatically after the completion of the Erie Canal, which connected the Great Lakes to Albany, New York. And then from Albany, people could reach New York City via the Hudson River. And as railroads started to expand in the 19th century, Buffalo became a major railway hub. Its proximity to Niagara Falls helped make the falls a major tourist destination. In 1801, Theodosia Burr and Joseph Alston visited the falls as part of their honeymoon. They were kind of the it couple at the time, and that's this helped set the trend of Niagara as a honeymoon destination. Although sometimes people give that credit to Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, Jerome, who also honeymooned there in 1804. It was another hundred years or so, though, before Niagara Falls really started billing itself as the honeymoon capital of the world. By the 1830s, the tourist industry was booming in Niagara Falls. Hotels and knick-knack shops and tourist attractions were popping up everywhere, and developers were buying the prettiest vantage points along the river so that they could charge people to take a look. And people were already complaining that the area around the falls was too commercial and too tacky. So (laughs) complaints about commercialization at Niagara. Not new. (laughs) Not new. 
remotely, and it was much to the chagrin of European visitors. In the words of Alexis de Tocqueville in a letter to a friend in 1831, quote, if you wish to see this place in its grandeur, hasten. If you delay, your Niagara will have been spoiled for you. Already the forest round it is being cleared. The Romans are putting steeples on the Pantheon. I don't give the Americans 10 years to establish a saw or flour mill at the base of the cataract. This letter uh, was prescient. (laughs) Industry also became a major part of the Niagara scene, with mills and their water wheels dotting the river. Nikola Tesla famously worked on a hydropower plant that started operation on November 16th, 1896. Eventually, there were so many mills that they physically affected the flow of the water over the falls. Some of the tourist attractions that still exist today date back to the 19th century. The Maid of the Mist started operating in 1846. That's uh, one of the boats that will take you up to the bottom of the falls in a little colorful poncho. Uh, At first, the Maid of the Mist was a passenger vessel that was carrying people across the river, so it was serving a much more practical role. When a suspension bridge opened across the river in 1848, the Maid of the Mist became a sightseeing vessel. By the 1860s, there was so much commercial activity and other development at Niagara that people started calling for some kind of preservation effort. A group of politicians and prominent public figures started the Free Niagara Movement to encourage the state of New York to buy back some of the private land and restore it as a public park. It was both about preserving the natural beauty of the park and making it so that people could view the falls for free rather than having to pay a mill owner for a peek at a view that also included all of their industrial equipment. This eventually led to the Niagara Reservation Act in 1883 and the creation of Niagara Falls State Park, established as Niagara Reservation in 1885. The park itself was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. The Niagara Parks Commission was established in Ontario in 1885 as well. And on the Canadian side, the area adjacent to the falls is Queen Victoria Park today. Throughout all this time of commercialization, industrialization, and preservation at Niagara, performers were also working at the falls, trying to make a living by entertaining tourists. And in the days before TV and film, daredevils were a huge draw. Sam Patch, also known as the Yankee Leaper, jumped off a platform on Goat Island, which is between Horseshoe and American Falls, on October 7, 1829. He jumped from a height of 85 feet, it's about 26 meters, and he survived. He made another jump from a height of 130 feet, that's 40 meters, on October 17th. He survived that one too, although he died during a jump near Rochester less than a month later. There was also a lot of wire walking at the falls. Jean-Francois Gravelet, also known as Charles Blondin, was the first person to cross the falls on a tightrope on June 30th, 1859. About 25,000 spectators gathered to watch him do this, and then he went on to do a whole, whole lot of other wire walking stunts at Niagara, including carrying his manager across on his back, and one time carrying a stove to the halfway point and cooking breakfast on there. And once he was done cooking this omelet or whatever, he lowered it down to people on board the Maid of the Mist on the river below. He kept doing all of this daredevilry until 1896, and he was the first of really many wire walkers at the falls. That is a big old ball of nope for me. Um, yeah, there. well, and there's, <laughs> I mean, there is still wire walking at the falls. Like, I... I remember back in the day when we were owned by Discovery, there being a much hyped wire walk at the falls that was yes. going to be on TV. It's still a thing. Yeah, all of that is a big nope for me. Uh, like, why would you do that when you could sit on the boat? <laughs> I understand the impulse. I just, it's not for me. Uh, Steve Brody claimed that he went over the falls in nothing but a padded rubber suit in 1899, but there is no evidence that this feat ever actually happened. He had also made a disputed claim to have jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge and survived. One popular stunt was to try to survive the extremely treacherous Niagara Whirlpool, which is downstream from Niagara Falls at a point where the river makes a sharp bend. People would try to make it through this treacherous whirlpool in barrels or sometimes protected by nothing other than a life preserver. 
On June 6th of 1861, Joel Robinson successfully took the Maid of the Mists through the Whirlpool after it was sold to a company in Montreal that would only accept delivery on Lake Ontario. Matthew Webb, who had been the first person to swim across the English Channel, died trying to swim that stretch of the river in 1883. This is just a sampling of all the daredevil stunting that was going on at Niagara Falls leading up to the turn of the 20th century. But one thing all of these daredevils had in common, nearly all of them were men. It was a very masculine world, which made the first person to go over a falls in a barrel even more of a novelty. And we're going to talk about her after we pause for a sponsor break. Annie Edson was born October 24th, 1838, near Auburn, New York. Her parents were Merrick Edson and Lucretia Warren, and the family was pretty well off. Merrick owned some milling interests, and the family spent their summers out in the country and their winters in the city. Annie also had at least two older brothers. She had an adventurous streak from the time she was quite young. She liked to be outdoors and to read adventure stories, and she also had a fondness for Roman history. Her father died when she was 10, and at 14, she and her brothers were sent to a private seminary to finish their educations. Four years later, Annie married David S. Taylor. They had one child together, although the baby didn't live past infancy. David was killed while fighting in the Civil War, and at first, Annie still had enough money to live on. But it soon became clear that that money was not going to last forever. Her seminary education also hadn't really set her up for supporting herself, so she enrolled in a state teaching college. After she finished her studies at the teaching college, she spent a few years traveling to different cities where she had friends and family working as a teacher. It was, I mean, really, it was all over the United States. She also went back to school again to study dance and physical culture. If you remember from our episode on Fort Shaw Indian School, physical culture is a combination of calisthenics and strength training and general health and wellness that was really popular in the 19th century. She started teaching dance and physical culture and even opening her own school, even though that school failed. Sometime around 1898, Taylor moved to Bay City, Michigan. By this point, she was really unhappy with her prospects for her life. She had gone from a comfortable childhood and youth to working as an itinerant teacher. She'd also had a series of misfortunes in which she lost a lot of the savings that she had, including living through both a robbery and a fire. There were no pensions or retirement programs, and she didn't want to be poor or live off the charity of her friends. So she kept trying to think of ways to earn money, enough money to be self-sufficient and comfortable again. According to some accounts, she had heard about Steve Brody's alleged stunt at Niagara Falls, and she didn't think he had really done it. But it's possible that having heard about that planted the seed for her own stunt later on. In her words, quote, Two years I had been constantly studying, when not occupied in teaching, what I could do to make money, to make it honestly and quickly. All kinds of schemes ran riot through my brain. Reading in a New York paper about people going to the Pan American Exposition and from there to Niagara Falls, the idea came to me like a flash of light. Go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. No one has ever accomplished this feat. I did not think it wrong, as there was nothing immodest in the act, nor did it involve the life of anyone but myself. I believe in prayer and that God will answer if only there is faith. As my motive was not a selfish one, but to succor two friends— one who has little children, the other in delicate health, and to aid myself financially. I believed I would live. I was determined to live, to vindicate to the world God's mercy and goodness. So as a side note, the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, which she referenced there, is where President William McKinley was assassinated. He was shot on September 6, 1901, and he died several days later. It's not totally clear where in the timeline Taylor thought up this stunt or whether the assassination affected her plans at all. Regardless, though, she knew that to make this journey and survive, she would need the right barrel. She started mocking up models, cutting them out of paper and sewing them together with twine. And ultimately, she designed a custom-made barrel that was about five feet or one and a half meters tall, and it had a 12-inch head, a 20 
4-inch middle and a 15-inch foot. So that's 30 centimeters, 60 centimeters, and 38 centimeters from head to foot. She selected white Kentucky oak for the wood with 10 riveted metal hoops. Taylor also planned for a ballast, sometimes it's described as an anvil, that would be in the bottom of the barrel, and she hoped this would make the barrel stay upright while she floated down the river, rather than having it just roll around every which way with her inside of it. She looked for a cooper to make the barrel, and once she found one, he refused to do it. He thought this was way too dangerous a plan for any person, and that she would surely be killed if she tried it. But she persisted, and eventually he gave in. The final barrel had the words, Queen of the Mist, on the side. Going over the falls in a barrel was just one step in Taylor's plan for her future prosperity. From there, she was planning to go on a lecture tour, so she hired a man named Frank M. Russell to act as her manager. She decided on October 23rd, 1901, as the day for her plunge. This was the day before her 63rd birthday. But thinking that no one would want to come and see a 60-something woman daredevil or on the lecture circuit, she and Russell described her as being 20 years younger. Everyone but Taylor and maybe also Russell thought this was a terrible idea. Authorities thought it was so dangerous that they told Russell they would charge him with manslaughter if Taylor died in the attempt. But even as everyone she encountered tried to talk her out of it, Taylor insisted that she would do it. She even did a trial run by sending her cat over in a barrel on the 18th of October. According to most reports, the cat was frightened, but okay. It makes me not like her very much, frankly. But It makes a lot of people not like her very much. Uh, I I understand. (laughs) Yeah, I... That's my own thing. I read one, uh, you know, there are a number of sort of retrospectives in more recent years that people have written, and there was one that I read that just was not charitable in its read of her at all. And that was one of the things the person was so mad about. Yeah. Uh, But on the 23rd, the day she had selected, the weather was bad. High winds made the surface of the already fast-moving Niagara River incredibly choppy. She had hired two men to assist her, Fred Truesdale and William Holleran. Truesdale and Holleran looked at the water and they said there was no way that they could safely navigate to the drop-off point in those conditions. Taylor was crushed, but she tried again the next day, her 63rd birthday. Truesdale and Holleran rowed her out to Grass Island, and there, away from the crowds of thousands of people who had come to watch her do this, she took off her hat and coat and overskirt and got into this barrel. Inside, she tied one strap around her waist and another around her foot with the hope of keeping her head from slamming into the top of the barrel. The barrel was packed with cushioning, and once the lid was on, her assistants used a bicycle pump to pump in more air. Sometimes this is described as trying to pressurize it, but she was afraid of running out of oxygen before getting to the falls. To avoid being swept over the falls themselves, her assistants had to cut her loose almost a mile away. So she had a lengthy journey before even getting to the falls, followed by a wait for someone to fish her out of the water. Once the air had been pumped in, Taylor plugged the air hole with a cork. Almost immediately, though, it turned out that her fears of running out of air uh, were maybe not totally founded. It, the barrel was not airtight. It also was not watertight. It started leaking, and soon her feet were in a pool of freezing water. At about four in the afternoon, after rowing to the deepest part of the river, Taylor's assistants cut her loose. And that's where we're going to pause for a sponsor break. Here's how Annie Edson Taylor described those first moments adrift in the Niagara River. Quote, My heart swelled, and for some moments I felt as though I were being suffocated, but I determined to be brave. By a supreme effort of will, I calmed myself at once and began earnestly to pray. If it was God's will to spare my life, if not, give me an easy death. This reminds me a little bit of Henry Box Brown's account of being in the box while being shipped around. I'm going to say he has a much better reason to be put in a box and sent somewhere. I wholly concur. But just that moment of like, I'm trapped. I'm just going to pray. and Like, <laughs> like I'm either going to gut it out or it's going to end. Uh, the rapids on the upper Niagara turned out to not be all that bad. 
the water in the barrel kept getting deeper, and there was the constant tension and anticipation of when she would get to the falls and whether she would survive going over. But in terms of how rough the ride itself was, she was pleasantly surprised. Then at about 4.23, the barrel finally shot over the falls. In her words, quote, I thought for a moment my senses were lost. The feeling was one of absolute horror, but I still knew when I struck the water of the lower river. The shock was not so great, but I went down, down until the momentum had spent itself. For a few brief moments, she was completely underwater, but then the submerged barrel came back up under the torrent, and that turned out to be worse than the anticipation or the fall. She described it as being whirled like a dasher in a churn. After several terrifying minutes constantly spinning and striking rocks, the barrel finally popped out from under the cataract, and Taylor lost consciousness. But then, the Maid of the Mist, which had resumed operation in 1885, came to retrieve the barrel. Chief Engineer John Ross was the person who opened the barrel and exclaimed, the woman is very much alive, or something similar. She replied something along the lines of, yes, she is, though much hurt and confused. I don't think I would be that composed in my initial speech after something like that, but uh, probably mine would not be fit to print. Taylor was bleeding from a head wound when she was pulled out of the water, and she almost certainly had a concussion. But other than that and some bruises, she was unharmed. She had become the first person known to go over Niagara Falls and survive. Like we said earlier, thousands of people had come out to watch this stunt, and it was covered in the Niagara area newspapers and some other scattered newspapers as well, but it wasn't really that big of a news sensation elsewhere. The Boston Daily Globe had a small feature about it, for example, but when I looked through the New York Times archive, I didn't find anything about it. As it turned out, uh, her manager was incompetent, a fraud, or both. A lot of other well-publicized stunts at Niagara had been performed before throngs of spectators who paid for a seat on bleachers that had been put up just for the event. Russell didn't arrange anything like that. The only thing he tried to do to make money on the day was sell signed photographs. He also didn't do a very good job of getting her on her planned lecture tour. She did appear at the Pan American Exposition, but the only engagements that he lined up for her after that were at dime museums, which she thought those were beneath her. So there's some accountability there on her, too. He did line up work for her that she did not wants to do, but, like, it also wasn't the work she had been wanting to do. Taylor's decision to bill herself as 43 instead of 63 also came back to bite her, because when people did come to see her, they did not believe that this old woman could possibly be the 43-year-old Annie Edson Taylor that they had heard about. I actually think the fact that she was 63... Could be the selling point! Right! Yeah. Like, today it definitely could be the selling point, but, uh... No, she didn't think that was going to work. <laughs> that was a poor calculation on their part. The closest thing that Taylor ever got to a lecture tour was a series of engagements appearing in department store windows where she would pose with her barrel. And then Frank Russell disappeared, taking that barrel with him. She found a new manager who hired a younger woman to impersonate her. Taylor never got her barrel back, even after borrowing money to hire a private investigator to go look for it. Eventually, she had a replica barrel made and went back to Niagara Falls, where she tried to make ends meet by posing with this replica barrel on the sidewalk and selling postcards. She also wrote a brief autobiography in 1902. We have quoted from it. It's probably embellished, especially in some of the places we didn't quote from. So, for example... It took a lot of guts to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. But she also said that while being robbed at gunpoint, she looked at a robber who had a gun to her head and said, quote, blow away, I would as soon be without brains as without money. And that as a result, this robber let her live. That just seems like an unbelievable presence of mind in the middle of an armed robbery, but maybe that's just me. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, to me, it seems impossible. I couldn't pull that off. But I also would have said a whole lot of expletives when I came out of a barrel. So I, <laughs> clearly, I am not of a mind to handle either of these things in the calmest of manners. Annie Edson Taylor spent her last years at the Niagara County Almshouse, and she died on April 29th, 1921, 
at the age of 83. She is buried at Oakwood Cemetery in Niagara Falls, New York, in an area called Stranger's Rest, which is the burial site of a number of Niagara daredevils. After Annie Edson Taylor survived her trip over Niagara Falls, she's reported to have said, no one ought to ever do that again. Or, to be even more direct, quote, I would sooner walk up to the mouth of a cannon knowing it was going to blow me to pieces than make another trip over the falls. You know, she just seems like maybe she had, like, a way with words. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But in spite of these warnings, she did start something of a trend. In addition to people who have been swept over the falls by accident or have intentionally gone over without intending to survive, at least 16 people have tried going over the falls in a barrel or some other kind of barrel-like device since Annie Edson Taylor did it. 11 of those people have survived. The next person after Taylor was Bobby Leach. He went over the falls on July 25th, 1911, so not quite 10 years later. Before his trip over the falls in a steel barrel, he had performed with Barnum & Bailey's Circus as a diver and a stunt swimmer. He did this stunt as part of a much-hyped triple challenge that also involved him parachuting off the upper suspension bridge at Niagara and going through the whirlpool in a barrel. He broke several bones and as he was going over the falls. And then after he recovered, he went on a speaking tour of the United States and Europe with his barrel. He was on a four-month speaking tour of New Zealand when he slipped on an orange peel, broke his leg, and died of complications of gangrene on April 28th of 1926. So while he did have more of a career in showmanship than Andy Sands and Taylor did, this is definitely a case of uh, like him doing something she had done 10 years before, but becoming famous for it in a way she had not been able to do. Yeah, he kind of had exactly the career she had hoped for yeah. right up until that orange peel incident. Yeah. Uh, also, don't go over Niagara in a barrel. It's dangerous and illegal. <laughs> we are not advocating going over Niagara in a barrel. Yeah, just, I mean, I uh, again, clearly I am not a daredevil in my heart, but I just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> sit in a nice restaurant nearby and watch the falls and eat. That's what we did at Niagara Falls. After walking around Niagara Falls, we had a wonderful lunch at a lovely restaurant where we sat there and watched the falls while we ate. That sounds great. Why <laughs> would you want to give it up? It was great. It was great. Do you have some great listener mail? I do. This listener mail is from Jessica. And Jessica says, hi, Holly and Tracy. Happy first day of summer. So this was sent on the first day of summer. Uh, Thank you for your work on the podcast. It helps me get through my daily commute here. I've been a longtime listener, but never written in. I just finished the latest podcast, Six Impossible Episodes, Evacuating Children, and thought you would like to know about a connection to a piece of 90s animation, given Holly's interest in animation and history. In the section on Operation Baby Lift, my ears perked up as it was one of the few evacuations I could picture in my mind's eye, thanks to the animated cartoon Hey Arnold. This seems like an odd connection, since Hey Arnold is a children's cartoon centered around kids growing up in the 90s, and Operation Baby Lift was an evacuation in the 1970s Vietnam. But in a heartwarming and tear-jerking episode of the cartoon, one of the tenants in the boarding house which the titular character Arnold lives in with his grandparents, tells the story of how he was separated from his daughter during the Vietnam War when he put her on a helicopter to evacuate to America. The story of how the character, Mr. Wynn, made the decision to flee the country and eventually be separated from her in order to save her life is told through a flashback to the war. The show goes on to demonstrate the pain felt by parents who were separated from their children during these types of evacuations and the difficulty in trying to find them once the conflict has ended. Mr. Wynn spent 20 years making his way to America and desperately searching in a foreign city for his child. Uh, In the end... Spoiler alert, Mr. Wynn is reunited with his daughter thanks to one of the other child characters, and there is a tear-inducing happy ending. I've attached a link to the clip for your viewing pleasure. I'm going to say I watched this clip this morning at my desk, and I was glad to be alone because then I was crying (laughs) about this cartoon that I had never seen before in my life and knew nothing about until this moment. Jessica goes on to say, 
Obviously, they don't call out the country or the name of the evacuation, but it was clear from the context clues what conflict they were discussing. As someone born well after the Vietnam War, the stories from that time come mostly from popular media and hardly ever deal with the impact and the people who were on the Vietnam side. This clip has stuck with me for many years as how devastating decisions and sacrifices people have to make in order to give their families a better life. The show doesn't go on to examine the relationship between Mr. Nguyen and his daughter, or explain the type of foster family she would have been placed with. But I thought it was an interesting look into something not often talked about. I thought you would enjoy this odd connection and the deeply moving way in which a children's show can help educate on some of the harshest moments in our history. Keep up the great podcasting. Cheers, Jessica. Jessica was one of our listeners who wrote to us from Canada, which was very exciting. I, like I said, had never even really... I had never watched any of this show ever. It was barely even in my consciousness as a show that existed. And when I first saw children's show having something to do with Operation Baby Lift, my first gut impulse was like, uh-oh. Like, <laughs> you were picturing is... Grave of the Fireflies, weren't you? Like something no. on that level of, like, pain. No, I was, uh, I was, um, I was picturing something more like a poo from the Simpsons does social commentary. Oh, you know. um, but you know, it, it's th- then I I looked into it a little bit more, and it seems like that character is a little bit more fleshed out in some cases, um, and it, at least based on one of the blogs by a Vietnamese person that I read <laughs> this morning as I was learning about this episode and this character and this show. So that is. Definitely fascinating. Thank you for writing and sending that in. Uh, if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We are also on social media as Missed in History. That is our Facebook and our Pinterest and our Instagram and our Twitter. You can come to MissedInHistory.com where there is an archive of every episode we've ever done and show notes for the episodes that Holly and I have done together. And you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and whatever else you use to listen to podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 